And welcome everyone again to the MyFest Entangled Pedagogy session. Tim, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Tim Fawns. I'm a senior lecturer in clinical education at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and I just am very sort of overwhelmed by the fact that people uh, you know that I'm allowed to do this is so so exciting. Um, is there anything else I need to say about myself other than I, well, I wrote a paper and uh, and we'll see what it is. You've been thinking about this for several years, or at least more than one, um, and it culminated in a beautiful paper that I think a lot of people are are curious about and wanna wanna try. So thank you so much for doing this for us, Tim. I'm Mahabeli. I'm co-organizer of MyFest and I'm at the American University in Cairo. And I'm not really giving the workshop, I'm just here to support Tim, <laughs> uh, which is mainly all Tim. So um, yeah, so what's something that is entangled in your everyday experience? You know, before we get into entangled pedagogy, what's something that's entangled in your everyday experience? Let us know in the chat. Christine, life and work. Work and home, parenting, work and home and study, reading and working. Yes. Parenting and commuting, past, present, future. <laughs> parenting for values and practicality of meeting. Oh. Cosmic angst. That's big. <laughs> Social media accounts. <laughs> Don't use the wrong one for the wrong things. Literature reviews, guilt over personal privilege, over desire to use that privilege to lift up others. Lots of parenting coming here. Communities, family, friends, disciplines, surviving every day, living in South Africa. News, I don't know why I keep reading. Erwin, I don't read news for that reason. <laughs> Work and free time. Everyone's perspective on life should be lived or how to teach. Politics, Cairo, <laughs> quantum states, quantum computation, entanglement is a resource in quantum computation. I did not know that, but that makes sense. What's happening in different parts of the world. Yeah, that's a really interesting one. Uh -huh. All right, so I'm gonna put these links in the chat, although you all got them probably by email already. This is the blog that Christina Hendricks um, wrote earlier this week or last week maybe, and Tim, and I'm gonna leave it to you. Go ahead, Tim. Thanks very much. So I'll try not to take too long because the best bit of this will be um, everyone working together and chatting together, but just to give you a quick overview of the, the entangled pedagogy model that I proposed in the paper. Um, and as Maha said, I worked on over a few years, actually out in the open as much as I could on Twitter, sharing diagrams, getting comments from the community, which was fantastic. And if you're one of the people that commented on that, then thank you so much, because it was it was a great way to, um, to develop an idea. So we have four columns. The left one I've called technology drives pedagogy, and it's a sort of technological determinism view where so you see our technology as being able to solve problems independently. And you see a lot of this in marketing and rhetoric around ed tech where, you know, this new thing is going to solve this problem. It can also be the opposite where you have someone who says this new technology in and of itself will cause massive problems without considering the context and the uses that it's going to be put to and, and the people that are going to use it and how, et cetera. Second column, pedagogy drives technology, is something I hear very often in education, and it's often a response to that first um, technological solutionism and determinism, where people say, no, 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 you can't let technology drive pedagogy. It has to be the other way around. Pedagogy has to come first, and we have to make sure that technology doesn't get in the way of what we, what we want to do in teaching and learning. And I'm sympathetic to the idea there but problematically, it doesn't give enough influence to technology. Technology is always already there when we arrive to do some, some teaching and learning. So if we don't think about the way that it mutually shapes other stuff, then we are um, vulnerable to an instrumentalist idea of technology where you can teachers and, and learners can kind of do what they want um, without technology, without having to consider the shaping 
mutual shaping effect of technology. So I've said that those two views are illusions because it can seem like you can put one or the other first, but actually they all, they're always entangled. They always go together and you can't separate out technology from pedagogy in my view. So the most important um, column for today is the actual column. Thanks, Maha. Very seamlessly changing slides without <laughs> needing any indication. Um, so this is where one of the one of the problems I think of um, the pedagogy first kind of angle is that often we we use methods, teaching methods by default, um, without really considering whether it whether we want to rethink the methods in relation to the new context. And in emergency remote teaching, we saw a lot of this where people try to continue existing teaching methods in a totally new context. Um, so rather than allowing technology to come first or prioritizing methods by default, we need to recognize that actually teaching methods, assessment methods, technologies are mutually shaped and shaping context. So what level of education is this? What discipline is it? Where are the learners located? What are their conditions? What's the institutional policy and infrastructure context look like? What are the different purposes in play? Looking beyond learning outcomes to what else um, are we trying to achieve through education? And what do we value? So considering all of that together is where I think a more realistic understanding of education comes about. The aspirational um, column is really about how do we um, how do we work together to negotiate the different relational aspects of, of these elements that come together in education. How can we collaborate? Because the expertise that's required to make sense of entangled pedagogy is distributed across teachers and students and librarians and IT staff and managers and policymakers and employers. And, and actually, education isn't just done by teachers, but it's done by all of these people together. Therefore, I think we need to um, embrace uncertainty. We need to acknowledge imperfection. We need to think about openness, being honest with each other so that the communication and collaboration is a lot easier. So um, please ask questions about that on Mentimeter or on the Padlet or in the chat, um, because I've, I've done my overview now and we're gonna move on to the cool bit, um, but please feel free to keep asking questions for clarification as we go. I'm just gonna share this for Mentimeter the QR code, if people want to use the QR code or go to menti.com and the code is 76350635 or I'm also going to share this link. What's going to happen is with these questions, <laughs> just so that we use the recording time well, is we're going to send you guys, we're going to do something together in the main room right now, but start putting in your questions and uploading other people's questions whenever you want. Um, and what we're going to do now is we're going to do an exercise together in the main room and then invite you guys to go to the breakout room to, to do it together in smaller groups for different topics. But while you're in the breakout room and the breakout room is not recorded, Tim will stay here with me in the main room and answer the question, questions that you guys um, have contributed. So you will be able to watch the answers to the questions later um, afterwards in the recording. All right, so we thought that would be a good good use of time. So sort of warping time a little bit. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Sam. Okay, so thank you, Maha. So what we wanted to do first was work through an example um, of how to think about this entanglement with a, situa a particular educational activity or challenge in your setting. And we would like one or two, probably one main um, volunteer to work through this with us out in the open in this main room so that when you go to your breakout rooms you have an idea of what it is that we're hoping you will do so um, I guess via the chat who would like to volunteer to think through and you can change this example if you'd prefer but we thought we'd just give you a starter um, the example of Jenny Jenny, is that a raise hand to, to be one of us? Yes, yes. I saw your hand, I promise. 
Fantastic. Don't worry, you guys. I will download the chat and send it to you. This is my personal account, so I think I don't have it enabled, but I'll, I'll download it and send it to you after the session. Okay, Jenny, who wants to, to join Jenny? Come to the main stage. Can you remind me what we're volunteering for? <laughs> you are volunteering to talk about, okay, let me share the screen again. You're volunteering to practice entangled pedagogy on this very entangled topic. So Nitma, you're volunteering as well, right? So the example is promoting academic integrity and promoting contract cheating. If we were to take an entangled perspective, Okay, Rose is, Rose is joining us even though she has no, there are many other examples coming up that you will do in the breakout room by choice. All right, so we have Rose, Jenny, and my daughter saying hi to Rose and Nitma. All right. Yes, I'm here. All right, thank you. All right, so I'll go uh, to the next slide. Wait, don't worry, we're gonna sort of lead you into it. <laughs> All right, so this is the educational challenge or activity that we're working with. And Tim, go ahead. So um, bearing, you'll get back to what the question was. So don't worry if you've forgotten it already. I sort of have. Um, but these are the questions that we're going to work through. Uh, so first of all, thinking what is involved and we're going to make a list. Um, I'm going to take notes for you and you're going to think about what people are involved and, and with we're being as expansive as possible and it's going to be messy. And that's kind of the point. So what people are involved, uh, what methods of teaching and assessment are involved, what technologies are involved, what contextual elements are involved. And again, this is a tricky bit, but it might be to do with the institutions, the context of um, academic integrity and why it matters in your, where you are. So is it a professional mm -hmm. program, that sort of thing? What are the purposes involved? Um, what, what, what are the reasons for trying to do this? And what do different stakeholders think is important in terms of values? All right, and it has to be um, an activity related to uh, technology, like it's an entangled activity, right? Yeah, and you'll find that all activities are entangled when they're to do with education and technology. So don't worry too much if you've if you've picked the right activity because it will, you know, it will be entangled. All right. Um, but we're suggesting um, the promotion of academic integrity through um, preventing contract cheating, but in negotiation, if you want to change that, you can. And in your breakout rooms, you'll have more choice. Can I ask a stupid question? Can somebody Certainly. define for me what you mean by contract cheating? Because I'm not quite sure. Oh, okay. the definition. This is when students pay someone to take a course for them or do an exam for them or write a paper for okay. them, whether it's one off or long term. Got so it. Not cheating okay. from another student, but like, you know, cheating from a professional or something. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I know the definition of it. Thank you. Sure. Also, sense. you can't get this wrong and people will help you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a great way to start anything. <laughs> so ahead, um, once we've got this big list, we're going to think, how do these different elements interrelate? And this is going to be tricky um, because I'll be taking notes on your behalf, but we can just try and write some stuff down about how the different things that you write on your list interrelate um, via brainstorming. I may not try and draw a map while you're doing it or visualize it, but, um, but these are good ways of, um, of trying to capture this sort of thing. And again, the more tangled it gets, the better. So you're gonna have a big mess there. Um, and then why do those entanglements, why do those relations between different elements on your list matter? Um, so what are the opportunities that they create? What are the constraints? What are the ethical considerations? And I was also thinking, um, I, I would, didn't add it because I think we've got enough, but it's interesting in relation to evaluation as well. You know, how, how well did something go? Mm -hmm. um, but let's, we can add that or not if we up to, if we like. And then the final question is what can be done and by whom? So on the basis of all that entangled stuff, what, what, what can happen and, and who should do it? Now I need to seamlessly switch over to the slide so I can take notes um, while you begin to think about a list. So I don't know, Will. Right. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, Maha, you might need to go back into slideshow so that people can read. But the problem is if it's on slideshow and you're typing, people won't see what you're typing. 
Were they? Huh. No. It's okay. gonna show the last thing. I if if I was on a Mac, I could uh, select it and make it show in a larger font. Um, or we could just have just to change your it change your screen out. size. You just need to change the view. If you go to view and there's a percentage, uh, that's a good idea. Thank you, Rose. That's an excellent yeah. See, this is way of doing it. Distributed yeah. expertise yeah. and uh, Zoom, right? Yeah, it's at sixty-two yeah. percent. Just make it bigger. Yeah, you can make it a lot bigger, however mm, just much you in. want it to be. Yeah. Oh, that's too. Then in. you have to scroll. I'll work, though. I'll work on it. Yeah, I'll. I'll okay. It says Control Alt minus. Okay. So I just want to ask Tim. Basically, what you're asking us to do is to start a conversation. Is that what it is? Yeah, and these questions are prompt. So actually, in this whole session, there's a principle here, which is if you don't really like the way we've suggested it, then just do it a different <laughs> way. Um, <laughs> the main thing is to have a conversation and to come up with a whole bunch of things that and why they are a bit messy and how they interrelate. So those questions are like a way to get you started. For example, um, if you're thinking about academic integrity and contract cheating, who's involved? So obviously there would be students involved. I'll give you that as a start. So I, I, I want to share a story, but then I'm not quite sure whether it's appropriate or not, because I was actually involved in something like this a um, few years back. Um, there was a situation where there was a course that the instructor discovered um, that students were cheating, quote unquote cheating, because what happened is um, uh, there was a, a group of students in, in a, I think one of those Greek, Greek um, um, houses, uh, they had been collecting photocopies or copies of past exams over the many, many years. And so people, students were just kind of um, studying from those um, past exam questions. And the instructor was, you know, a little bit too automated. He just kind of took past years questions and used um, the LMS to randomize the questions. And if you had actually read the past 10 years worth of questions, you would be able to answer everything um, in any exam, no matter how randomized it is. And I was uh, one of the instructional designers at the university at that time. And I was called in to quote unquote solve the problem. But ironically, in the end, what I did was I persuaded the instructor to look at the end objective. If the end objective of the course is for students to learn and to learn as much as they're supposed to learn, then encouraging them to quote unquote cheat by reading past years questions is actually a good thing, right? Because then they're actually taking the trouble to read everything from the past 10 years and they are ready for any kind of exam questions, regardless of what comes out. And in the end, um, I think the instructor understood my logic behind it. And we changed the entire syllabus for that year's final exam. And we actually encouraged people to go and research as much as they could. What are all the potential possible questions that could ever, ever show up in any final exam? And in the end, all the students really were, you know, it became a treasure hunt for them to find as many past questions as possible that exist out there. And in the end, um, you know, the students really came out of the semester enjoying the semester. They realized that this instructor wasn't trying to make their life miserable with the final exam. And they all just kind of had fun. So we redesigned the final exam to be a um, treasure hunt. So I don't know, is that the kind of contracted cheating you're talking about or totally different? I don't know. I may be off topic. Well, I would say that's not contract cheating, but it's, you know, it, it still works. What do you think, Maha? I think it works because it's a way of thinking about academic integrity in the first place. And I think it might reduce contract cheating just by thinking about it this way. I like a couple of people are, are liking this quote unquote cheating that you said, Rose. And uh, Claire Thompson was saying that when teachers use past papers and questions as part of the learning experience, so you cheat to practice. <laughs> so it's uh, it's it's cool the, the way people are responding. To this. So let's think then all of our volunteers um, thinking about like where you are and maybe maybe broadening it out to cheating more generally than rather than contract cheating. Um, who who is involved here so in if it was contract cheating then you might think well the the companies that um that produce contract cheating or the other students who write essays that are then um uploaded to contract cheating services that sort of thing mm -hmm. uh so 
cheating often involves other students, right? Um, in my contacts team in the UK, or yours too, because you're at Edinburgh, I mean, contract cheating is now illegal, isn't it? Or you can be, um, you can get in non-only uni trouble. And the reason I rave my hands frantically is I've been given, in the way you get given things at unis, um, responsibility <laughs> for figuring out how to talk to our students about academic in integrity and contract cheating. And the reason I was given it is because the previous people involved in the conversation who were mainly academics came at it from this perspective of it's wrong. You know, it's wrong. It's because you don't understand, don't do it. And they, it just didn't work. And so for me, it's also about broadening out who's involved to um, like, often these students have part-time jobs so that you know there's pressure on them from their families to be able to pay for university in a way so then they're also trying to succeed because those families are helping them attend in addition to that there's um skipping around to sort of some of the context there's assessment criteria that sort of encourages this kind of behavior or certainly doesn't take into account students as human beings <laughs> um, and leaves them with uh, very little choice and then um finally there's institutional policies and leaders who focus their energy on contextualizing academic integrity as a student's problem as opposed to like a system problem or a university area to look at and it's it, um, I think it ignores the entangled nature of something like this right where it isolates it into as if it's one group's job to um to fix it. And so, um, yeah, there's just a lot going on. I mean, library staff are involved, because they always get involved if there's anything we're referencing. Any other support staff, disciplinary boards, it can get very, very intense very quickly, um, you know, for people who get involved. Yeah, that's all super helpful. Um, so let's just keep going uh, and keep making a bigger mess on this notes page. Um, do, do we want to go, do we want to think about which technologies are involved here in terms of cheating and the prevention of cheating? And I just want to note that the chat is incredible and rich and we will send it to you because people are talking about, oh, the teachers that are overloaded are part of, uh, you know, and so many different things. Um, and Nisma, remember, you're one of our volunteers too, so we're, we'd love to hear from you as well. So Jenny's uh, already writing. Yeah, go ahead. Okay because I, I think I... I misunderstood the topic uh, or the question itself. Uh, I thought you just want, I don't have an incident about cheating, except like uh, normal cheating. I, I don't have uh, something related to technology or contract cheating. Yeah, so, well, we've broadened it. So any way of promoting academic integrity in the institution, what kind of technologies would be involved if you were on a committee in your institution and you were responsible to promote academic integrity or and reduce cheating. So right. any of those, there's no right answer. We're just yeah, make, yeah. bringing out all the complexity of what it is because mm -hmm. a lot of times people come up with solutions that don't recognize, I think the complexity and that's. Uh, I think the problem that we really have is using internet. If we cut off the internet, I think things will be fine. Uh, because I have noticed that uh, students, like, how can I was doing a, an activity today in class and uh, uh, students were doing a vocabulary activity and I thought like they could easily cheat. I don't have any control over that and it's, it's almost impossible to go back to printing papers uh, um, after we have been through the COVID and doing things online. So I'm just wondering what can I do? Like, how, how can I cut off the internet? Because this is the, the real issue now. Uh, they have access to everything and it's almost impossible. Uh, I think the way the, the solution is to change the way of assessment. Uh, it's not anymore the traditional way or the typical way of assessing students. We have to think outside the box and think of other ways and alternatives of assessing students. So just to mention, Nesma, that um, what we want is when we're, when we're writing all this stuff down, we want to think about anything that matters. So I've written down printing and paper that you mentioned, for example, not because it's happening right now, because the historical context matters. This is how people used to do these forms of assessment on printing and paper. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of has an implication for the culture of assessment and what people think is legitimate um, and that's mm -hmm. why we're, we're trying to just reach 
as far out as we can to gather all, all the ingredients, if you like. And then we're going to think about the relations between those ingredients. Mm. I wonder if we can fast forward a little bit so that we give people more time in the breakout rooms. Yeah, yeah. Um, just pick pick another question to ask the volunteers, and then we'll we'll do breakout rooms. Okay. Um, so if we can think about that question too about the interrelation um, of elements, and I don't know whether you were able to jump off that slide and back on it, Maha, because there's more stuff on. Yeah, there we go. Um, Maybe we pick a couple of things. People were mentioning AI and proctoring. Maybe we jump to that just for a bit of difference. Um, thinking about that in relation to um, leaders and policymakers, families, law enforcement, and other students. Um, can people come up with like some ways in which those things are kind of entangled? Does that make any sense to you? So, for example, um, or, we, or we might take the assessment criteria, for example, that we'll mention mm. before. Assessment criteria are important in terms of thinking about what, what is it that we judge quality by. Mm -hmm. But then if we bring in AI um, technology, for example, writing assignments for people, then those assessment criteria can be demonstrated, but not by, not in the way that we want or not by the people. Mm -hmm. So can we think it just pick a couple of things on the list there and think about how they are related. So when I talk to students about assessment and uh, academic integrity. I focus a lot on the fact that we use it as a proxy. We use assessment as a proxy for being unable to see inside their heads. So I said this in the chat. And so my question from for the technologies would be like, is there a better way using some other mechanism to understand what our students understand, you know, um, in such a way that we can still manage to mark everything <laughs> uh, and things like that. And I think the, the intersection there is or the, you know, the sort of the functionality there is, is key. Um, and then also going back to this idea that we're not marking a paper because you have to write a paper. We're marking a paper because a long time ago, like mostly white men were writing each other letters <laughs> to claim ownership of ideas, right? It was like, no, I thought of it first. I wrote it down here. I sent you the letter. And we're still writing letters in, you know, in the form of journal articles. So like, what else could we do? What technology could we use to... Um, not maybe be so focused on owning an idea, mm -hmm. but on adding it. Like we are working uh, in some ways in a module. We're having we're having um, students upload to a blog, and then the next year students have to read and cite those blogs and like add to the class reading. Um, and so it keeps being built year on year. And the idea there is that like you're joining a conversation. You're not in isolation trying to somehow demonstrate and and own an idea. And I just I wonder if we can use technology to push that as a concept. And I think we can then move away from things like contract cheating because you wouldn't need to do it. Yeah, that's really interesting um, idea. And there's some really interesting stuff in the chat. I'm not really able to catch, catch up, but there is a really interesting, uh, this connection between class sizes and then that the thing that forces teachers to do time-saving things, which then are often uh, you know, more cheatable or more AIable. Okay, shall we do like one more thing before we uh, yeah. wake up? Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, we, we've already said a little bit about number three, why do these, or how do the entanglements matter? Um, now let's think about what can be done and by whom. And uh, a couple of ideas there about joining the conversation and thinking about not competition and not individualization, but adding and being part of a conversation. But let's think about um, who does that. So you mentioned maybe we can bring technology in to kind of do that. But one of the premises here is you can't just bring technology in and do that. You need to attend to the mix of technology and the methods that we take and the context and the values and the purposes. So for example, you couldn't just bring technology in to make assessment suddenly be collaborative rather than competitive, you would have to think about the culture and what assessment methods would you use and that sort of thing. So this is, we're getting closer to where we just need to note down thoughts because it's too difficult to, um, to come up with solutions in two minutes. Um, but thoughts on what can be done 
as a way of getting started um, would be great. And another principle for this session is it isn't an attempt to solve a whole bunch of things here. It's an attempt to go through a process of starting to pick out the, the complexity, the ingredients, the entanglements, so that you've had a you've had a go at it and then you can do it in more depth in the future. So vague thoughts, absolutely welcome at this point. So uh, Tim, as I said, I think I, I would like to go back to the assessment. Um, so I think it's um, one of the issues that we can, that can really help in um, uh, uh, promoting the academic integrity. So we don't have to use the, again, the traditional ways of assessment, but we have to innovate and uh, new ways of assessment. So I think this should help with the contract cheating because then students wouldn't be able to cheat. So for example, uh, presenting in the classroom or uh, project-based learning, so things like that, I think uh, should help uh, promote the academic integrity. Um, I added something in the chat as well. I said um, one of the reasons why contract cheating happens, especially when you're talking about um, heavy writing, like thesis writing and all that, is because a lot of times um, if you're talking about assessment of content, what happens if a student, their, their primary language is not the language in which the assessment is happening? Um, a lot of times students are, are you know, forced into getting external help. And I, I actually know some supervisors who encourage them to get paid help, uh, you know, because if, if they just can't even get their, their publications um, understood because of the language differences, um, but their content is absolutely, you know, stellar, but the, the language is a problem, then is that cheating or not? You know, where do, where do you draw the line and, and why is it considered cheating if it is a student's, you know, primary language and then it's not cheating if it is a student's, you know, uh, foreign language or whatever. So it's just, it's just an open-ended comment. Um, it's a very messy situation, I think, because you, you can't really put a fine line on it when you're dealing with those kind of situations. Yeah, I think that's a great thing to think about what what constitutes cheating and why um, and thinking about what is it that matters. So again, going back to not just the methods and the technology, but the values and the purpose purposes, what's the point here and what do we care about? And can we factor those things into this mix so that what we do actually it, it aligns with we can negotiate values amongst the different people who are involved and then come up with approaches that are attuned to those values and the purposes at hand, et cetera. Maha, I'm okay. assuming you would like us to move on to the breakout rooms. Yes, as well as I would like to do that. So here's, um, I mean, I'll let Tim explain the process, but I just wanted to let you know two things. So first thing, I'm gonna put the link to the Mentimeter for the Q&A. You have questions put them there if you've written something in the chat it's really difficult to go find it so if you want a question answered by tim put in the mentimeter and upvote the ones that other people have written that you'd like answered and we'll answer them while we're recording while you guys are in the breakout room. for the breakout rooms uh we have some breakout rooms with different topics and we're going to let you choose which room you want to go to so you can discuss the topic that you're interested in sort of uh, looking at the questions to guide you um, so we have a few quest topics, but if you want a particular topic, uh, can we pause the chatting just for a minute so that people who have a particular topic they'd like included in the breakout rooms, let us know because I'm gonna name the breakout rooms by the topic titles. Um, and I'll let, I'll let Tim, okay, group work, all right. Tim, I'll let you explain the, the exercise. Okay, so first of all, I, I want to give you some guiding ideas, um, which are, are this exercise is as much about process and participation as outcome. So don't worry if you basically don't produce anything that you know that's that's clear or great, um, but that you've gone through and had a good conversation. I also want you to relax. Um, we're not going to solve any massive problems right now, but we're going to go through an exercise that's going to be helpful in the future. I'm hoping. Um, I want you to enjoy this so that if you don't do, if you do one thing, enjoy it. Um, 
And I want you to care about yourself, other participants and your setting. So think about this from the point of view of care. I want to care about me having a nice time in this next few minutes. I want to care about the other people and, and we're going to be respectful of each other. And we're, I'm going to care about my setting. How can I and, and the settings of other people? How can we really think about these settings in as much complexity as possible so that we can care so I, i'm kind of making this connection between understanding complexity where you are and care because i think if you only have a partial view or a, well, you, you only inevitably have a partial view but if you're happy with a very simplistic partial view then then uh the caring possibilities are very limited i also want you to experiment here so don't worry about whether you're saying the right things just say as many things as you can um, you might want to nominate somebody to take some notes on the slide. Um, it, do we have a link to this? I'll put a link to the slides in the chat. Yeah. Um, maybe a smart thing to do would be to quickly put your name at the top of the slides that you go to. Mm -hmm. um, so that if someone's name is already there, you can go to a different one. If you want to be anonymous, use a pseudonym. That's fine. Yeah. So, so, so we, right now we have some slides have a topic and there's a breakout room for those and some slides don't. So if you're picking a topic that doesn't have a name, just type it in yourself. And then within um, each breakout room, you've got those guiding questions um, along the right. What's involved? How do they interrelate? Why do they matter? What can be done? You can ignore those if you want, but they're probably helpful and just make a big mess of that slide. And Maha, um, can you please explain how you're going to move people around if they want to be moved? Yeah. So first of all, if you have a relatively updated version of Zoom, uh, what do you mean? Can you have the questions in the chat? Um, it's going to be really difficult to go find the questions in the chat. I'm going to, I could try to, hmm, let me see. One second. Um, I think I kind of know what Tony's asking, <laughs> but if, I, if I'm not doing what you're asking, Tony, let me know. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to tell you what the topics of the breakout rooms are for the moment, which I think is what you want to know, so that you can know what you want to do for the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Yeah, I think Tony's saying that he's okay now because of the slide URL, so we can have a look at what the questions are in there. Yeah, right. And I've, and I've also taken a screenshot of the breakout rooms so that has the, the different topics of the breakout rooms. And then, yeah, and then you pick the slide and the slide has the questions on the side. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is, um, it's a move yourself to the breakout room type of situation. If you don't know how to move yourself to a breakout room, just tell me which room you want to go to and I can move you. The, there's two rooms at the end, a quiet room if you just want to sit quietly. So if you go there, don't talk to anyone. <laughs> or a general chatting room if you just want to chat in a very open-ended manner rather than talk about a particular topic. And then the other ones have topics. So there's numbers one to eight have topics. Room nine and 10 don't have a topic right now, but if people think of a topic, you can name it. And uh, don't get too hung up on which topic. All topics will work and it doesn't, you want to kind of just get yeah. into the, the activity yeah. rather than take too long with yeah. worrying about which topic so i am going to open the breakout rooms for 15 minutes um as soon as i do that which is going to be right now uh let me see how many people have the slides open enough people have the slides open 30 something all right okay so the breakout rooms are now open if you know how to move yourself to a breakout room you should be able to see a little breakout icon and i'm seeing that some people are doing that already if you can't find it, like if you're on your phone or the version of Zoom that you have isn't working for that, let me know in the chat which room you want to go to and I will move you. Looks like most people are able to move themselves. If you find yourself alone in a room, obviously come back. <laughs> or if you find your room getting too big, some rooms are getting so big. I guess we'll let them tangle up together. <laughs> They're going to get really entangled with this room with, with uh, five, 10, no, oh. 11 people. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I was joining from another meeting. Sorry. Which, which room is which topic? Um, so can you see the breakout room icon, Jan? There should be a little icon with lots of little squares. 
Uh, um, one second. I see. It might be hidden in a button that says more at the bottom. Okay, yeah, more I have. Break the academic yeah. integrity mm -hmm. topic doesn't have a lot oh, of Oh, I see. Does All the topics are there. Gotcha. Them? Okay. Yeah. Does anyone um, want to join the academic integrity? Nobody is there. There's one person alone, I mean. Uh, let's see. Google. Anybody want to join her? No? Contract cheating. Contract cheating. Um, uh, Laura is break? saying, can you put me into contact cheating? Oh, so contract no. cheating. Okay. Well, yeah, she put herself. Out. You figured it out. I figured okay. it out. Awesome. That's great. Yes, sir. Are you able to move yourself? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine. That's totally you're fine. able to? Oh, you're just making your choice? Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Rissa, uh, do you, are you staying with us? Do you want to go somewhere? Oh, we're no, recording this taking... messy part. It's just taking me an extraordinarily long time to figure out where I want to go. Okay. <laughs> so okay. sorry. Sorry. Cool, I'll do. No problem. I'll Ooh, do. That. Three people went to the quiet room. That's the first time I use it and people actually go there. I can understand that. I mean, the chat's so good, right? That you might want to just keep going with chat. <laughs> okay. We've got some questions. All right. Let me share the screen and we can do the questions. All right. So here's the first question. How might entangled pedagogy shape the organizational structures in higher education? For example, what might a center for learning and teaching and um, informed by um, entangled pedagogy look like? I like this. That's a fantastic question. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so there's some, shall I start? Um, there, one of the things I think about faculty development or academic development in relation to entangled pedagogy is that it's necessary to look beyond what do individuals know and to think about what people know collectively. Um, so for example, some of, some of the ways we try to teach teachers are like individual training and workshops that are about individualized learning outcomes. Whereas what we might wanna do is promote the capacity for different people to get together and negotiate what what matters to them how they want to think about the different aspects that are going on beyond the immediate teaching in a session to like the wider program um, some of which might be advocating for resources some of it might be um, building up bigger networks that are you know that are not just like small teaching teams and and basically looking beyond their si the silos that they work in. I was just going to say the silos is the main thing, right? Like with the Center for Learning and Teaching, oh, you're not responsible for procuring technology, but you're responsible for helping people use it. And you're not responsible for the political implications of that, you know, but not asking, saying you're not, this is not part of your job, but bringing all the people with that expertise together and that collective wisdom. Well put. Okay, so the next question is can you imagine the center for entangled pedagogy or something the center for entangled teaching and learning <laughs> all right this question how does entangled pedagogy overlap with other pedagogy have you got any thoughts you can start us off with there it's entangled with the other pedagogy <laughs> <laughs> yeah i get i guess i there are so many different ways of defining pedagogy. The one in entangled pedagogy is quite expansive. It's like bringing all of this collective activity together. It's enacted by multiple people in interaction. Um, so you can, there was a question, I think it might've been Veronica really early on in the chat about what's different here from situated learning. So I think this is an angle on situated learning it's seeing learning as situated but it's making sure that that situated learning isn't done by an individual and it's not facilitated by an individual it's quite an expansive situation it's thinking about not just an immediate situation but the way that situation is embedded in an entangled mess of things 
that makes sense? I would say that, yeah. I mean, I would say, I don't know if you've ever seen this from you, but I have a roomy cheese analogy, which is all the different layers that you put together to create an inclusive or equitable classroom. And I think what the entangled pedagogy does, it recognizes that no one pedagogy on its own will meet all, will do anything on its own. And it's entangled with the technology and it's entangled with the context. And so I, I think it's, it's, it's the thing that, is expansive for all the things <laughs> rather than <laughs> claiming to be the thing it claims to include all the things that's right that's right and it, um you you want to think about whatever pedagogies you're thinking of in relation to technologies and values and purpose so if you yeah. use a pedagogy that doesn't really take those things into consideration then entangled pedagogy would suggest you need to factor them in somehow yeah, and it looks like Veronica or someone put that question into the Mentimeter as well. And I think we've answered it, right? It's not yeah, just great, about the technology, question. but yeah. All right, what are some of the pitfalls to this pedagogy and what are some of the benefits? Huh. Well, the pitfalls is really hard. Like The pitfalls is you just can keep talking forever and ever and ever of, of showing the complexity of something to the extent that you get overwhelmed or yeah. that people won't have patience for your... I think this is my problem in my department. My boss is not here today, but uh, that sometimes you don't want to ignore certain angles before you make a decision. And then it can make it really difficult either to make a decision or, or, the, or the right decision becomes not feasible because you've looked at all the angles. Yeah. And I, I had this conversation with John Dron, who writes about a similar sort of thing. Um, what how, was this thing called? I remember he was talking about it on Twitter. But we I had a co-participation framework. Um, so it's like everybody's teaching and learning together and there aren't these clear distinctions. So there's loads of parallels. And we were sort of talking about how trying, using these frameworks and models is a way of trying to be able to hold open the complexity because the temptation is always to like shut it down, simplify and move on. And these frameworks are like, how can we hold this open so we can see more things? But um, doing that doesn't always lend itself to any clear action. And in fact, um, Karen Barad and other people talk about agential cuts. You know, if you're talking about complexity and entanglement, you can go on forever. But in reality, you need to decide where, where am I going to stop? so that I can do something. Um, context, for example, in the entangled pedagogy framework could be endless. Um, so one of, part of the kind of expertise of entangled pedagogy, as I see it, is being able to make decisions about what is most relevant, but they have to be informed decisions that are informed yeah. by context and values and purpose yeah. and technology. I'm sort of thinking like if you're a person who's teaching a course tomorrow or a educational technology is taking a decision about what kind of uh, room setup you're gonna have or something. You have to make a decision at a certain point, but if you've thought about the entanglements, then in the moment, you'll be able to respond better because you've thought of all these things ahead of time, not because you've planned everything ahead of time, but because you understand it better and therefore your reactions might be better. Um, so that's why I think one of the benefits is, is, because what happens if you don't look at all the complexity is that you might ignore something that's really important and things fail or they behave differently than what you expected. This is going to happen anyway, but I mean, it's worse if you haven't thought of all the angles. That's right. And I think there's an ethical side to this as well. It's like, it's more, you're more likely to be able to act and decide ethically if you've considered the big picture rather than if you have a more narrow view of things. Yeah. I agree. All right, this one, just thinking that entanglement of, pedag bleh, entanglement of pedagogy and technology might help to explain the persistence of educational technologies, which should have been superseded long ago. So it's just a thought. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I think all these questions are so good. I, I totally agree. Um, it's the entanglement of stuff that makes it harder to just pick and choose what you want because you're stuck with things that are embedded in a system that that technology is never one thing it's always an assembly this is john drawn again but it's always an assembly of multiple technologies you're always working with not just turn it in but turn it in and a vle and mm. microsoft word and the internet and all of these things and that that assembly of multiple things is really what you're dealing with and therefore if entanglement is um part of part of the the Part of the appeal of 
the entanglement metaphor to me is that it's both strengthening and constraining. So we talked about the family as a metaphor of where if you had no family, in some senses, you would be freer to move around. Um, you wouldn't have to you wouldn't have to worry about what your family would think of what you did. You'd be kind of freer, but you would be weaker as well in most cases because you wouldn't have this support network, nurturing environment. You wouldn't be attached mm -hmm. to anything and, and the freedom would be a sort of emptier thing. And it, so you can't just get rid of the, the old things that are part of the culture and the uh, makeup of how you do education. Mm -hmm. And that's good and bad in various ways. Yeah, that's true. I, I was going through a thought process and then your family example, which we talked about a lot before, got in the way of, uh, of that one. <laughs> I was just thinking, I was, was going to ask you about assembly versus entanglement, because assembly feels more orderly to me, feels like a collage or a salad, and entanglement feels like a smoothie, and then you can decide how, how far to, <laughs> to mix it. But I'm not sure necessarily if that's because I, I wouldn't know what to do with the family metaphor then with this yeah well you can't it's very difficult to assemble a family um i i suspect you're i suspect you're right um i think maybe it's m multiple technologies entangled rather than assembled i think you can it's possible to bring bring order to mm. certain aspects of of like an education activity but yeah. but that order is then entangled in yeah. other stuff so it's never and the never, order is an uh, imposition it's not the natural necessarily way of i mean i guess some things are separable and some things are not obviously the degree of entanglement differs right yeah and i guess what i'd say is like there might be order but that order always sits within a bigger entanglement so the the, the bigger thing is always an yeah you can't control everything yeah. you, no matter how hard you try yeah it's kind of like the more they write a more orderly uh, learning outcome and rubric doesn't actually make the learning experience less messy <laughs> just because you've written it very clearly, you know. <laughs> uh, this is a nice one, and I think this is a nice one to end on. It's the last question we have. Uh, reminded of systems and complexity and the criticism of both of these frameworks that they aim to overcome messiness, so they're reductive. And the goal of entangled pedagogy is to untangle or to embrace it? That's the question. Yeah, fantastic question to end on. My view is um, we want to embrace it because we can't do anything about it. We can't untangle. It's not possible to disentangle everything. Um, so we want to accept and appreciate and develop our capacity to negotiate this mess um, rather than fix it. What's your view, Maha? Yeah, I agree. I think I might have thought that that was what we wanted to do, but from lots of conversations with you, I'm seeing that that's not the point. When we were planning this session at first, we were trying to get people to use entangled pedagogy to solve a problem. And then we realized that's not really what we want them to do. They, they'll jump ahead, right? That's not what we want. We want them to illuminate. We want to illuminate the complexity and entanglement to better be able to make decisions in general and not for a particular decision in a particular point of time. Um, yeah, it's almost time for people to come back. Uh, we will only have about four minutes for people to share out. Are you able to stay a few more minutes if people want to? Yeah, how, how many minutes shall I tell them we can stay extra if they want? Well, I can stay um, however long, so I guess. I'll okay, so let's that. say 15, 15 minutes or so. Uh, just so that if people do need to leave but they don't want to miss out, we were not taking up too much of their time. Um, and then we'll, uh, I'll, I think I'll close the Mentimeter for now. Think. Oh, and well, I'll leave it open. And then if we find more questions there, we can answer them on the Padlet later. And what we'll tell people is that they can uh, use the Padlet. Um, do you need a drink of water or anything before people come back? I'm going to close the breakout rooms. All right, great. I'm quite surprised by... Uh, the choices people made in terms of rooms and i didn't check if they were uh if they were taking notes i can go look now oh my god lots of notes not all of them messy Woo! the teaching inclusive courses is really messy slide cool really nice welcome back claudia or claudia
Thank you. All right, people will be here in 12 seconds. <laughs> There's some interesting questions in um, teaching teachers about entanglement. Mm. Welcome back, everybody. We hope you had a good time in your breakout rooms. Um, so we have two minutes until we leave, but we are recording. So if you need to leave, Tim has agreed to stay for 15 more minutes if people want to share out from their breakout rooms, and we will record that. So if someone needs to leave, they will get that. If you still have questions, we've answered all the questions uh, while you guys were in the breakout room, so that's going to be in the recording. Um, and then you will you have access to the Padlet, and you can keep adding questions there. And uh, I will make Tim come back and <laughs> look at them and answer them. I'll make sure that happens. Uh, but for now, so so first of all, if you have to leave, uh, please give us feedback. Um, and Tim has given you the Twitter hashtag and and all that. Um, and then we'd love if one person from each breakout room would like to share out and if anyone needs to leave, thank you so much for joining us. All right, so who would like, who, is any group willing to share? Just anyone raise your hand or say you're happy to share. Erwin, was that a physical hand raise or were you just moving your hands? <laughs> it's a hand raise, I'm taking it as a hand raise, but you're muted, so I don't know. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll, do you want a quick run through here? Yeah, please. Is that what you say? Okay, so we talked about pro procurement of technology and uh, a wide variety, as I'm sure with most of these people who are involved in agencies, um, with the idea that quite often uh, ed tech is going to be, uh, tends to have quite a large influence in all of that. Uh, we definitely saw that during the um, pandemic where uh, a sudden switch to Microsoft Teams, for instance, happened in a lot of institutions, uh, which starts to colonize the learning spaces without having given it the thought that typically is given to creating, you know, learning spaces, virtual learning spaces. Uh, Zoom is another one. Um, so things like that, where we're making these calls without the kind of thoughtful uh, preparation that we need. Ed techs, IT department, um, and also even tech vendors tend to have an influence. They tend to position themselves as partners. And somehow, if they get to the right people in senior administration, they seem to be able to propose these wonderful partnerships that are going to lead us out of this mess, uh, rather than lead us back into a worse one. Um, just anybody, you can raise your hand if you think I sound cynical sometimes. <laughs> How do these elements interrelate? Well, we identified the idea of tensions, uh, and a good example would be information security coming from IT versus student faculty ease of access. We, had, we covered a few examples of that. But the idea that both tensions on both sides are there are legitimate concerns and we want to distinguish concerns from interests interests tend to be self-serving at least in the way we define it whereas in, whereas concerns are things that we need to care about uh, in, in our professional responsibilities and those need to be uh, discussed and negotiated um, uh, other ones are such as the idea that technology is substitute for people so in other words we can uh, the technology can do more than people can do. Um, and so it can be a way of automating uh, interactions. Um, ongoing costs to support new technology. A lot of times, and I'm sure you've seen it, I have, where the new technology comes in, a new system, and it actually raises costs because now you're, now you're uh, bonded to a very high paid consultant. So you have to keep coming in and making changes as time goes on. These entanglements matter because they provide opportunities for conversations about these things. It maps, it can help you map out a change strategy. Uh, it can look at questions of, you know, where does creativity fit in? Where does innovation fit versus having to scale things? So these are, these are complex issues that need to be discussed widely and among many of these areas. What can be done? Evaluate concerns for each, whole, each uh, concerned group. Um, have a careful discussion, bring the voices in and ethical evaluation of technology through many different lenses. It's not just one ethical set of questions. We, ethics um, looks different from different perspectives and, and needs to be um, looked at in a, in a way of diversity. I think that's kind of maybe a, a rough summary. And if anybody wants to jump in and correct it or add, please do. 
Thank you so much, Erwin. And a lot of people in the chat are telling you your cynicism is well-founded and everyone <laughs> appreciates it. <laughs> okay. Tim, do you want to say something before the next group comes up? I yes. see Troy and Rose are saying. Go ahead. Just to thank that group for some great ideas that came out of that about the distinction between interests and concerns, the idea of multiple lenses for ethical evaluation. These are um, really good insights, I think. And although, you know, you probably haven't solved the problem of procurement and technology, I think that you've started out on unpicking lots of um, stuff and entanglements. It's really valuable. So I'm very happy with what you did. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I was seeing Troy and Rose talking about which of them was going to present. So was this your topic? Yep, that's us. I can jump in. So all of us broadly had roles in teacher education. So uh, thanks to Antonio for proposing the topic. Um, you can read about the feelings. There's still lots of tensions um, that are happening in the you know, wake of uh, emergency remote teaching. We were talking a little bit about where this type of training for pre-service and in-service professional development happens. But then uh, we got to the good stuff uh, down probably when you get to like the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, or those later bullet points, thinking about examples. Um, Christine shared one example of a faculty member saying how adamantly I am not using technology in my course. But then her pivot for that and the question was, well, what do you think your students are doing to support their learning? And how do you expect students to use technology, even if you're not explicitly using or teaching that technology? And so that um, got us into some larger conversations. Of course, there's always the push-pull tension entanglement between what we do in our classrooms, what needs to be done at the university level, what needs to happen in the real world, um, training and untraining and retraining people once they get out of formal education and into their actual workplace setting. And then um, we kind of ended with this idea of how conscious and thoughtfully are we unpacking these? How, how do we have conversations with our own students, with our own colleagues, with our departments, with others in our faculty development centers, our IT purchasing people uh, to have these conversations in really conscious ways. And so I'm uh, really grateful to Tim for the, the kind of model here for thinking about entanglement and this tension between pedagogy and technology to have those conversations. So thanks. Thank you. I just want to pick up on that. Uh... Was it pedagogy as a, oh no, entanglement as a conscious dance, fantastic. Um, and it's like a collective consciousness, hopefully, of, of where multiple people throughout different levels of the institution are all kind of conscious together about the dance, which is probably the hardest bit, I think. Maha, did you have any comments about that? That was fantastic, Troy, thanks. Yeah, just that it was fantastic. And a lot of people in the chat are also <laughs> commenting on that. All right, I really want to hear from the inclusive, uh, creating inclusive courses. Maybe we should have, you know, sort of uh, untangled that one. <laughs> it's such a big topic. And I think they had like 11 or 12 people. Do you guys have a volunteer to share? Oh, I can't see if anybody. Come on, you guys. Um, there must be someone still here. No? I will call on someone. <laughs> I'm going to do that thing because I can see your names. Come on. Don't be shy. Are you all like waiting for someone else to speak up? Is that what it is? I can say a bit. Um, Thanks. Je um, Jenny was like our, our leader, but she just left. <laughs> so, okay um but uh but yeah when we had a really um kind of lively discussion um and um i hope that we've managed to capture um uh, most of it here and that it, i think it mostly kind of makes sense um and uh, so we we felt that there's really like an enormous number of um different people different kinds of people involved um and um we talked about how inclusion uh could be um you know, it, the, even the, the, the concept of inclusion um, is um, open to interpretation. And so an, really an inclusive course might be 
very open and involve all kinds of people that you don't even know are involved. <laughs> and um, and so that also raised the kind of the, the tension of like what you're wanting to, to be extremely inclusive, but actually how can you be when you don't know who you're who you're including or not including and that that can make it, um, you know, quite challenging. Um, but we we did think about some of the key ways that you would try to be more inclusive, including through, um, uh, you know, uh, using um, uh, including, um, you know, web accessibility and things like this. Um, but also about um, thinking about um, the process of making courses as one of co-design rather than of the, the person who's kind of leading it in charge of it being uh, supposed to be all knowing from the outset, knowing what exactly what's going to be produced and exactly what's, uh, you know, what's needed by everyone who's going to come to it. Um, there's quite a bit more there, but um, I, I, you can read it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Leo, for jumping in. Um, is there any other room that would like guests? Jasmine, would you like to? Do you have a minute? Oh, okay. All right. You have to leave. Um, I don't know if Jan is still here, but it was good to see you, Jasmine. Oh. Yeah, Hi, Maha. Thanks. Yeah, no, I need to leave in a minute. Uh, Jan and I had a great conversation, but I don't think we quite captured it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. We Let wrote it on the slide. And it was oh. just the two of us. So we were uh, more sharing stories. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. As long as you had a great discussion, that's great um, to hear. Go ahead, I don't Jen. Know. Did you want? Did you want us to tell you about it? If you or? want to, I think Jasmine has to leave. So if you have a minute and you'd like to, that would be great. Um, so I ran into an interesting um, uh, encounter with a creative work I was working on, where I was reading somebody's memoir on the same subject and used a couple references. Um, in a play that I uh, there was just a reading at Kane and I was and I had used a couple references thinking that um, if you take a reference from one genre and um, drop it into another one that that would be okay but the author felt like it was poaching and so this notion of poaching came to mind which is entirely new to me and I was just wondering whether you guys feel that that is, in fact, um, it wouldn't be academic integrity violation, but creative uh, violation. Any thoughts about that? Tim, do you have an answer for that? I mean, academic integrity is a funny thing. I don't think it's absolute. I think it's... Um defined in relation to the discipline that you're in and the norms and values of your particular context. So it, I don't think there's an absolute right or wrong answer. I think you could make an argument either way. I, I, I find it really interesting to think about the ways in which academic misconduct in one context is a highly desirable and, and valuable learning behavior in another context, like mm -hmm. working with people and looking stuff up and using resources. and. Mm -hmm. I'm not Jen either. Jen or Maha, do you want to come and say? It's uh, the, I think the it, the waters are muddied when you have two writers writing about the same subject uh, in different genres. Then does the does the borrowing um, is it actually just not ethical? but it's not illegal, certainly. So that was the confusion. Yeah, I mean- I mean, it, you're citing, right? They just thought you, oh, you took so it's too much? A, it's, yeah, it's weird because in a play, you can't have someone on stage oh, right. say, <laughs> say, you know, and this is from this source. I see what you mean, I got yeah. you there. Although okay. I guess in, in the text, I guess you could, yeah. I see what you're saying there, yeah. I, I mean, I think part of the reason that values are so important in education is because you can use them to make judgments. Um, so you would probably need to make a value judgment and it, who, who gets to make the judgment is the other question. So like one of the, one of the um, issues with entangled pedagogy is the fact that there is often not a real clear answer to things. There's just ways of seeing how difficult it is. 
Yeah. I was actually, so I'll say something real quick, Jan. One of the things that I was thinking about, one of the things I was thinking about there is what's more important? Is it more important whether it's legal or is it more important how that person feels? And what yeah. kind of power dynamics are at play with that kind it of thing? Did. Because these kinds of things can be used for the dominant to reproduce hegemony and their own power, or they can be things where that person is actually someone who's historically been oppressed and this kind of behavior then reproduces oppression, right? So I don't know I who this person is was, or who it you was are the former. It was the former right. uh, yeah. that it was someone acclaimed in their field who felt like you're stepping on my territory yeah mm -hmm. um i'd yeah, like to, ahead, to ask i'd like to ask something tim you mentioned the word judgment um i'd like to just share that i personally what i do a lot when i do trainings and and, and uh development with others i tell people don't judge because judging is you know you're not god to judge and so i think it's it, it's just a play on the vocabulary, but what I say is that in, in teaching and learning, we do assessment, but we should not do judging because when we judge, then we are placing our own values onto others. Whereas if we do assessment, it's data driven. Um, and so I just I just wanted to ask, what's your your um, take on vocabulary? Because I think a lot of times if we if we maybe use vocabulary as a way of um, softly educating people to make them understand um, what the value systems are and and it's a it's a very entangled way of doing it but I'm just I'm just saying it, it just triggered me when I heard you saying just now and you said the word judgment and I'm like oh that's something that I I generally tell people not to do and so I, I so I like your point and you raise a good question I would try to avoid judging people but I not sure I could avoid judging situations um, in order to make a decision. Like, I don't think that I can make a decision without making a judgment, but I would try to make that judgment about what's going on rather than attach it to a person who, you know, does different things at different times, etc. So I also think that subjectivity is a part of expertise in the sense that you need to interpret what's going on from the perspective that you have and then decide what you think and then and then be able to act um so i don't know whether that reassures you or further <laughs> further concerns you no i get your point that you know a lot of times objective assessment is insufficient and you're saying that judgment which is a subjective thing there's a place for it still i, I get that Okay, Trail has had her hand up for a little bit. And so that's going to be probably the last comment we take and then closing remarks by Tim. Trail, go ahead. Um, well, I was just going to, our group did um, talked about group work, me and Virginia and Noha. And one of the, I'm not going to repeat everything we said, but I think one of the things, you know, that is common with all of these topics, well, one is that they're all entangled with each other, right? But um, something that, really stuck out to me is the question of purpose of what you're doing so like in group work is the purpose um mastery is it uh, peer peer learning is it to learn about working in teams is it to have fun is it to make it relevant to your life like what is the purpose of the group work and that will tie together sort of or in entangle right all the the people and the method that you use and maybe the, and the technology of course um so and I, I, that was, that was what stuck out for me personally. So Virginia and Noha might have different opinions about what stuck out for them the most. I'm really glad someone scribbled on a slide. I, I was kind of hoping that would happen. Um, so one of the, like Ros is right about how you need to be very careful about the way you use language. So in the final version, at least of the paper, I always put purposes, I think I did anyway, because I think that there are always multiple purposes, especially when you take multiple people into account. So the teacher's purposes are probably different from 
one students and those are probably different from another students and and you know there can be multiple teachers and they can have multiple purposes um so it's probably often all those things you know i i have a vague notion that it's important to have experiences of group work therefore one of the purposes of this activity is to give people the opportunity to have those experiences also they need to meet the learning outcomes and also you know they they need to have so many contact hours because our institution asked for that blah 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 so um one of the hard things and everything about this is kind of hard isn't it but one of the hard things is that there are a whole bunch of purposes held differently by different people and we need to somehow like negotiate them I love that negotiation element as well. Entangled workshop, Tony Carr is telling you. <laughs> is this an example of an entangled workshop? I think we've tried to mess it up as much as possible. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's important to try and model some of what we're talking about. So being quite open and honest, you know, don't really know how this is going to go as an experiment let's try it you you're responsible as well as us for how well it goes all these things you know i think modeling it is quite a good thing to try and do thank you so much tim and thank you everybody for making this workshop so amazing and the chat i have got so much fomo <laughs> from the chat i can usually keep up with a chat this is the first time i think in my life that i haven't been able to keep up with a chat it was so rich and so good and probably spend another hour just looking at it <laughs> it's going to be recorded it's recorded on zoom cloud so the chat will also be recorded there and i'm going to download and send it to you guys in an attachment and please give us feedback. Please give, keep asking questions and putting resources on the Padlet. This doesn't have to be over. And bug Tim as much as you like on Twitter. He's not with us on Slack. So unfortunately, not, not entangled enough. But <laughs> I, I could probably be persuaded. Oh, yeah? But yeah. I, I, it's just, you know, it's just um, not having kind of found the headspace to get there. But, but, but I could be persuaded for sure. Okay. Um, let I, me know. Let me know if you want to persuade Tim to to join us on Slack. Okay. I'm gonna stop the recording in case someone has a question they want to ask off the record. <laughs>